My name is Anna Nenonen. I was born in Finland, so I have a funny accent. Um, my art history degree is from Europe, from Obo Academy University. And I also have a Master of Fine Arts degree um, that I did in the US um, at uh, Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. And I'll be your instructor for the class on contemporary art. It's an online class. Our co-instructor is uh, Scott Contreras Cotterbay, so he will be helping me, uh, but mostly you'll be talking to uh, me and I'll be talking to you, and I'm looking forward to very good discussions. Uh, the first in the series of video lectures is an overview of uh, art uh, in Europe and the Americas from 1900 till about 1950. And um, we'll start with fauvism. Fauves were wild beasts of color. Fauvists were a loosely connected group that didn't have that many exhibitions, but they were influential for modernism and contemporary art in that they started to break away uh, from the impressionist tradition of uh, doing pe uh, people and uh, landscapes and uh, uh, scenes that uh, uh, looked still somewhat realistic. Even though they were impressionistic, they, they still had some realism to them. Um, it was maybe the first avant-garde mo movement in France in the 20th century. And they used colors directly from the tube. Uh, the name Fauvism, mean, Fauvism and uh, uh, the artist called Fauves, which means wildebeest, uh, was coined by critic Louis Vauxel, uh, who talked about their uh, paintings uh, uh, in uh, several uh, articles that he published. Uh, one of the leaders of the Fauvistic movement was Henri Matisse, and um, uh, the work that we are looking at now is his woman with the hat, uh, which shows a woman with unnatural colors. And uh, uh, it's not very three dimensional. There's some uh, illusion of space, but we already see uh, artists wanting to uh, make art that is very kind of flat and consists of mostly shapes and, and color. Uh, another example of Fauvism is André de Rand's uh, Mountains that has these loose uh, brush strokes or color directly from the tubes and uh, uses very, very vivid colors. And it really is about color uh, and shape and those uh, lines that uh, the strokes uh, uh, make rather than uh, meant to look like a realistic landscape. Um, one of the most famous um, artists of the 20th century uh, is Pablo Picasso. And um, he started out uh, being a child genius. Uh, he uh, was admitted to the Academy of uh, Arts or rather the uh, School of Fine Arts in Barcelona when he was only 13 years of age. So he was like Mozart. He, he was absolutely brilliant already when he was a teenager. Uh, Mozart, of course, was brilliant already when he was a child. Um, but he was a child prodigy. His father was teaching at the uh, Fine Arts uh, School in Barcelona. And at first they didn't want to admit Picasso, but his father uh, had Picasso do them a demonstration and his work was so good that he was admitted, although he was not the age that was uh, uh, typically um, when people got into that school. Uh, he's known for a seri series of periods of uh, uh, starting out representationally with the blue period, then rose period, uh, the African influences uh, period, analytic cubism and synthetic cubism that is also called the crystal period. So he reinvented himself many, many times. And early in his uh, artistic career, he was um, interested in circus people, and, and this family of Saldin Banks is, is people that are touring with the traveling circus. Uh, Picasso's as La Demoiselle d'Avignon, the young ladies of Avignon, was a fairly scandalous painting uh, at the time. Uh, it was, um, um, it was um, 
uh, when it was exhibited, uh, it um, raised a few eyebrows because of the sexuality of the women, first of all. Uh, they are prostitutes from uh, Avenue Street in Barcelona. And also how he depicted the women. Uh, on the left there, you have uh, uh, the women's faces depicted in the Iberian style, which was kind of traditional uh, for Spain. And then on the right, the faces are influenced by African masks. And he is, um, um, he is um, sectioning the picture plane into these faceted flat shapes, and that's how the uh, bodies are uh, composed. Uh, so raw sexuality and then the in-your-face uh, representation uh, of uh, uh, kind of primitive uh, faces and uh, these uh, um, flat um, uh, faceted uh, bodies. Um, Picasso experimented with lots of uh, uh, lots of uh, different media and different uh, styles. He even dabbled with uh, uh, with uh, neoclassicism at some point, and sometimes these styles overlapped. Uh, he also did sculpture, he did ceramics, and he did uh, etchings and, and drawings. He was a very prolific uh, person that was also extremely well connected, which uh, contributed to him being so successful uh, during his lifetime, and he became a household name. Cubism uh, was uh, developed by uh, Georges Braque and Pablo Picasso, uh, and Braque emulated Cezanne. Um, he was very uh, much influenced by Cezanne, and Cezanne uh, is known as being an artist's artist. Uh, he was an artist that other artists uh, admired a lot, and he was influential for uh, development of Cubism, amongst other things. Um, primitivism was an influence, non-Western sources were influences, and Cubists um, um, Cubist thought that art should not copy nature. Up to around 1910, uh, which is when this uh, painting was uh, painted, um, there were still uh, recognizable elements in uh, the Cubistic paintings, uh, such as here we have a jug, uh, we have uh, uh, a violin, uh, we have a palette. Uh, so if you look closely, you can make out these shapes uh, out of these uh, uh, faceted uh, um, cubistic uh, uh, shapes that uh, dominate the canvas. Um, an example of Picasso's um, um, experimental uh, nature in that um, uh, his sculptures are often quite interesting. This is mandolin and cl clarinet. So what did he do? It's an assemblage uh, type of uh, uh, sculpture, so scraps of wood, and then he drew the strings of the mandolin uh, into this uh, uh, piece of wood. And of course, these holes here uh, are where the clarinet would be. Um, the bridge and primitivism uh, German Expressionism uh, was born out of this. Um, three Nudes by uh, Carl Schmitt Rotluff um, is a good example of this. Die Brücke, uh, the bridge, was formed in Dresden around 1905. And um, they, the artists that belonged to it, they did not like complete abstraction. They, they showed um, figurative uh, subject matter, uh, or they made figurative paintings, uh, but they did not, even though they were highly stylized uh, and very uh, primitive uh, looking, as if children had painted them or crazy people had painted them, uh, they had to be abrasive, the colors had to be uh, uh, abrasive. Uh, they did not want to go into complete abstraction. Uh, another example of uh, of um, uh, the Brücke artists is Emil Nordes masks. So look at the faces. Is this really who we are when we look in the mirror in the morning? We put on one of these uh, masks, or is he talking that we maybe put a nice face on and this is how we really are beneath that? So people are always pretending to be something, but but actually world is not such a nice place all the time. And um, um, the paintings, typically are abrasive and crude in every fashion. Um, this is fairly elegant. It is um, 
by uh, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. Uh, it's a street scene in Berlin. He did a number of these street scenes, some in Dresden, some in Berlin, and it depicts uh, prostitutes. Ernst Ludwig Kirchner has, uh, had a fairly tragic life because he uh, took part in, uh, part in the First World War uh, during 1914, uh, uh, and he um, uh, suffered a men mental breakdown uh, when he was uh, a soldier in the war. And after that, um, he was in uh, uh, mental hospitals, asylums for treatment, and he finally ended up uh, uh, killing himself. And perhaps his abuse of alcohol had some, something to do with that too. And, and sometimes you can uh, see some of the influence of what he had suffered, not necessarily in this painting, but some of his uh, works. Of course, you have to be careful about biographical uh, interpretation of paintings, but I am convinced that many times artists put their own experiences, especially when it comes to uh, uh, expressionism, which is expressing uh, your feelings uh, or the angst of the anxiety uh, of uh, uh, of the world uh, in uh, uh, a form of uh, paintings. Egon Schiele, an Austrian um, painter and uh, known for these gouache uh, type of uh, uh, drawings, they combine drawing and, and painting. Um, he is um, a good example of uh, uh, Viennese Austrian art. He was a student of Gustav Klimt that made really decorative, beautiful paintings, often uh, a women. Kiss is very well known. Um, it is uh, a gorgeous, uh, 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 tender um, kiss study with, uh, with a lot of gold and uh, uh, decorative elements uh, to it. Uh, Klimt was incredibly successful and he uh, took Egon Schiele under his wing. So Egon Schiele was mentored by Gustav Klimt. Um, uh, Egon Schiele's subject matter uh, is um, often these two things. He himself, uh, he made a lot of self-portraits and then uh, studies of nude models and they were often underage girls. He married a 17-year-old artist model and then they uh, went to different villages to live because they were hounded out of the villages. The villages didn't like them using uh, uh, underage girls as models. Um, and um, Sheila was briefly accused of uh, uh, improper behavior towards an un underage girl, but he was acquitted and uh, probably nothing too bad went on, but he did like to paint this uh, uh, and draw this uh, kind of um, very, very, uh, raw, skinny, sexy uh, paintings and drawings uh, of uh, the human body and faces. Uh, Franz Mark, the large blue horses. Um, Franz Mark was the founding member of the Blauer Reiter. A Blauer Reiter was a group of artists that consisted of German and Russian expats um, that lived in uh, uh, Germany. And um, it, he painted paintings that uh, used often these primary colors, red, blue, and yellow. Uh, he attributed, um, attributed um, um, masculinity and spirituality to blue, violence and base matter to red, and yellow in his paintings symbolizes feminine joy. Uh, he used animals more often than people because they have maybe a more pantheistic um, uh, connection to uh, nature and therefore they are kind of more pure and genuine uh, in depicting universal uh, matter such as the largeness of nature than uh, pictures of people would be. Vasily Kandinsky was one of the members of the uh, Blue uh, Rider. Uh, he was originally a lawyer uh, who was offered um, a position uh, as uh, uh, professor of Roman law uh, in uh, Russia, but he turned it down and he began painting at age 30, so fairly late in life. Uh, he settled in Munich during the First World War. Uh, he was in Moscow and then he returned to Munich. 
And uh, he taught Bauhaus, which is a design school that we talk about a little bit later. Um, and Bauhaus was closed by Nazis in 1933, uh, when he then moved to France. And um, he is often accredited as uh, the person that made the first abstract paintings, the most uh, first completely abstract paintings. Uh, however, in paintings like this, you can see maybe a building uh, on the hill. There are some biomorphic um, forms. Uh, and um, he was interested in music. Uh, improvisation, uh, that's a mu musical term. Some of his paintings were called uh, compositions. He was an accomplished musician. And um, he said about um, uh, his work that uh, color is the keyboard, the eyes are the harmonies, the soul is the piano with many strings. The artist is the hand that plays, touching one key or another to cause vibration in the soul. Now, if you think about the relationship between art and music, um, music is abstract. Music uh, can be emotional, but it doesn't depict anything. So it's maybe the purest form of abstraction. So how could uh, a picture or a painting or any work of art be as abstract as music? And that was kind of the challenge uh, for Kandinsky, to make paintings that would be as purely and beautifully abstract as uh, music is. Um, he also wrote about art and um, two of the books that he wrote, or treatises rather, are about the spiritual in the art. Uh, he was a devout Russian Orthodox that was um, uh, interested in the New Age and apocalyptic themes. And he also dabbled in theosophy, which is kind of a mixture of uh, different religions, uh, uh, Hinduism and, and philosophy and Buddhism and Christianity. And then New Age. I mean, it would be the equivalent of uh, New Age uh, uh, thinking today, uh, that theosophy was at the time, uh, around the turn of the century. And amongst some of the ideas that he had in uh, his treatises, um, he thought about the uh, world as a triangle, and at the top of the triangle is God. At the bottom of the triangle is ordinary people, that's uh, the rest of the humanity. Uh, after God uh, comes the artist, and the artist is leading humanity into uh, a higher uh, existence. Well, he started out with uh, scenes from Larasan villages, and then uh, he uh, developed his style into a uh, complete uh, abstraction. And this was fairly early. So look at the dates, uh, 1913. And uh, um, this is a very uh, uh, typical painting of Kandinsky, very vibrant and uh, full of these abstract shapes and forms. He was obsessed with black holes, for example. We don't see one in this one, but um, he had all kinds of uh, uh, interests that then um, are, uh, are um, um, uh, inspiration for his paintings. Robert Delaunay, um, uh, another blue writer, uh, artist, um, you can see a few. Uh, it's mostly abstract uh, art in that it's shapes, in this case uh, circles, uh, but there is a biplane and there is an Eiffel Tower and there is a propeller of an aeroplane. Futurism is not really a very important style for the um, development of contemporary art, um, but it was a style uh, that was uh, um, really interested in showing movement. And um, the futurist artists often, uh, they admired fast cars and machinery. Uh, but here is a um, study uh, in the movement of, uh, of uh, a person that is uh, running. And um, this is really cute. It's at the Albright uh, Museum of, uh, uh, Albright Knox Museum in Buffalo. Uh, dynamism of a dog on a leash. So how do you show movement in a picture that doesn't move? Well, um, um, movie pictures were developed um, 
um, uh, partially uh, because of Edward Mybridge's uh, uh, experiments um, in the around 1880, uh, when he had uh, a device called Zoopractisope, where you could show rotate um, pictures uh, that he had taken in a sequence, like a horse running, for example, a racehorse, and then when you rotate them, uh, you um, get the sense of movement, and that then uh, became movies, um, film, um, that we, uh, uh, you know, we go to the movies today. Uh, but in a two-dimensional form, without the movement, well, perhaps this is the best you can do. Uh, back to Picasso. Guernica is one of Picasso's uh, most well-known uh, paintings, and it was um, created in response to the bombing of Guernica. Uh, that is in Basque country village. It is a Basque country village in northern Spain, and it was bombed by German and Italian warplanes uh, because the Spanish nationalist forces asked it to be um, bombed, and there was a civil war in Spain. Um, and the nationalist forces were on one side of the civil war, and then they asked their allies to uh, destroy this village. Um, there are a couple of interesting things in this. Um, um, it made a world tour after it was painted. Um, it uh, became uh, a tool for uh, attracting attention to the Spanish um, civil war worldwide and the horrors of uh, war in uh, general. Um, you can analyze it in many ways. Many analyses have been uh, made. What, what does he mean? Why is there a bull and a horse? There are some of the central figures in it. The sword uh, at the bottom, in, in the hand, the broken sword, maybe that is uh, uh, the um, villagers being defeated uh, under the oppression of uh, uh, the uh, Italians and Spanish uh, national uh, forces and, and Germans. Um, but uh, when asked about the bull and the horse, uh, Picasso said that bull is bull, horse is horse, I paint the objects for what they are. So he refused to explain what they mean. Uh, but he uses bull as an alter ego many times in his etchings and his, uh, uh, he keeps going back to bull. Of course, bull fights in, um, in Spain, they are, they are well known, uh, kind of beautiful bloody dance that uh, ends up in the death of the bull, but it's a ceremonial um, ceremonial show um, and tradition. Uh, so Spain bull bulls in the ancient art, uh, Assyrian Babylonian art would be uh, symbols of male fertility, and because it certainly puts the bull like the Minotaur in uh, uh, in uh, um, a Crete um, type of you know, rapist type of bull uh, into lots of sexual situations in his et etchings and his paintings. And, and he seems to identify with this bull because his uh, love life is well documented that uh, he has, uh, he had many wives and he has several mistresses and they were not always uh, treated that well. There's this movie called Surviving Picasso and I haven't seen it because I think I wouldn't like him anymore if I saw that. But anyway, you can be a brilliant artist and you don't need to be a saint. Um, so here we see people struggle against oppression uh, and that mirrors artist struggle. He said something about him having struggled against the reaction and death of art uh, all his uh, artistic life. Um, so you could see this as, as his struggle and um, um, the light bulb there in the um, ceiling or um, in the sky uh, that could be uh, sun, so that could be hope, but there are also um, scholars that have taught, said something about bombs, uh, some kind of reference to bomb, because of bomba, the light bulb, and, and the bomb, and the village is being bombed. Um, let's skip a little bit <laughs> over the ocean, Harlem Renaissance, Jacob Lawrence, the migration series. Um, Harlem Renaissance was... Um, uh, also called the New Negro Movement, uh, and it took place in the uh, 1920s and went on for uh, um, several decades. Um, there were artists and scholars and uh, uh, musicians 
uh, that um, were part of this movement. And uh, Jacob Lawrence is a well-known one um, who um, painted this one. Uh, it's um, about the great migration north by Southern African Americans. And there was also uh, Romar Bearden that made work about um, Southern experience. And um, he served in World War II, um, studied in Sorbonne in Paris, and uh, was part of a group called the Spiral that then uh, later was involved in human rights. So there were several very, very learned uh, artists, writers, uh, and uh, uh, musicians that um, were part of this uh, this uh, movement. And they drew a lot of subject matter from African-American experience. But you see so, how the figures are very stylized. Uh, Romar Bierlin uh, did collage, Jacob Lawrence did these uh, beautiful paintings. Um, back to Europe and go a little bit um, uh, into Russia. Uh, Kasim Rumalevich. Um, he was a pioneer of geometric abstract art and originator of avant-garde suprematism uh, in Russia. He, he, was a, uh, he was a Polish uh, Catholic. And um, uh, in 1915, he published a treaty, a little booklet called From Cubism to Suprematism. Uh, he's mostly known uh, for his black squares. And uh, when he died, uh, he was buried in a grave where there's a black square as the tombstone. Um, but here we see eight rect rectangles. And the, this is actually a political painting. It looks like completely abstract, art for art's sake, no, no story. But it does have a story uh, because it is um, the troops of the revolution, the Russian revolution. Uh, the reds were against the whites and the working classes against the uh, uh, ruling classes, the chars and uh, the landowners. So here is, it's a diagonal composition. So it's the advancement of the, uh, of the red troops and they're going to win. So at this time, Russian suprematist painting, painters believed in the revolution, but later now they were persecuted by Stalin and uh, um, they then usually went to exile and Russian art went into a completely different direction, namely this kind of social realism that depicted uh, uh, workers uh, in a very, very... Uh, uh, figurative, realistic, almost photorealistic uh, way in some uh, instances. So propaganda art that everybody can see what it is, not some intellectual uh, stuff such as these uh, red rectangles, even though they symbolize uh, Russian troops of the red. Um, he painted uh, black squares uh, on white background and he went as far as uh, paint white on white. And now, if you look at a painting like this in an art gallery, there are still people that work uh, in uh, this vein. Um, how far can you go? Uh, canvases have been turned, so you have shown people the background of the backside of a painting, so that's been done. Um, canvases has been slashed, so there have been canvases with little um, uh, little wounds in them, so to say, slashed with a knife. Uh, white on white, well, you can't go more abstract or minimalistic in painting uh, than this. Uh, well, of course, take away the rectangle and then you just have a white ca a canvas and nothing else. And, and that's been done. Uh, so 1918, uh, it was already done uh, about, uh, uh, about 100 years ago. Konstantin Prankusi is a modernist uh, sculptor. Uh, he was born in Romania, but he lived in uh, uh, France most of his life. He was interested in uh, universalizing form, uh, and he was interested in what most modernists were interested in, namely the purity and refinement uh, of uh, art. Uh, he started out with more references to nature and to people and the human body, uh, but then later uh, he started taking out uh, details um, 
and uh, going for uh, this really, really simple, uh, beautiful shapes in his sculptures. He did many of these torsos of a young man. It's a series. Um, this particular one is in Herson Museum in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, it's a small sculpture. Uh, when we look at um, art in reproductions, or, or this uh, used to be slides, but now it's digital images, um, it's often deceiving because this is not very big, but if it's blown up on a screen, it, it, it perhaps looks uh, larger than it is. And it's wood and uh, rock and uh, uh, metal. Uh, the torso is the crotch of the man. Usually torso is the upper part of the body, but it's like chopped off part of a person's body, the middle body. So the legs are coming out and then there's belly and it's this very, very simpli simplified uh, um, uh, form that he uses. Or he's distilled it into the essential, which is um, something that was uh, the goal of the modernists. Take away the inessential uh, and distill everything to the essential. Uh, newborn. Some of his sculptures are still, um, at this point, um, uh, biomorphic. So it looks maybe like an embryo or egg, or this could be the uh, bottom of a baby, uh, or it could be something to do with the head. Uh, so you can read all kinds of things into it, but it's a very simple, pure uh, uh, form and shape in the sculpture. Brancusi was uh, interested in uh, non-European art and especially in cycladic sculptures that were very popular uh, during uh, the modernist uh, heyday because modernist artists liked to collect them and uh, they were so popular that people started faking them. Uh, they're very very simple uh, sculptures from other cycladic islands in Greece uh, from uh, thousands of years ago. Dadaism. Dada was born out of negative reaction to the horrors of World War I. It was an international movement that was begun by a group of artists and poets associated with the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, there was an important branch of Berlin Dada in Germany uh, as well. Dada rejected reason and logic, prizing nonsense, irrationality and intuition. And in addition to being anti-war, Dada was also anti-bourgeois and had political affinities with the radical left. Uh, bourgeoisie is the middle class in, in uh, uh, France. That's where the name comes from, the burghers or the good burghers um, of, say, Holland uh, in the olden times. And those would be merchants and uh, doctors and lawyers and um, typically the uh, upper uh, middle class. Now it would be somebody who lives in the subdivision, has a SUV and uh, the biggest TV ever and uh, probably has a good job. Um, so they were artists that thought of them, themselves as rebels and avant-garde and they rejected these bourgeois middle class uh, values. Um, they thought that life and the world are irrational. There is no reason anymore. Because if something as horrible as the World War I could happen, where people were gassed and they were slaughtered uh, in the trenches, um, it was a very, very cruel war. If something like that can happen, then there is no reason in the world. People are not rational. Rational beings would not do that, that to each other. Uh, they would be solving um, conflicts with diplomacy instead. And God also goes right out of the window because uh, if there is God, God wouldn't allow that. And if God is omnipotent, surely he would do something to stop it. Um, the Dada poems, here is an example, and performances were very bizarre and uh, uh, very uh, nonsensical. They, they don't make any sense, and that's the irrationality of, of uh, the world. The world doesn't make any sense anymore. Uh, so art must reflect uh, society in that art doesn't make any sense uh, as either. Uh, Marcel Duchamp was not a Dadaist per se. He was closely associated with the Dadaists. Um, he is maybe uh, 
the most important figure in uh, uh, 20th century art, in early 20th century art, because uh, he is still influential. He was very influential for postmodernism, and he's still influential um, for um, he was influential for conceptual art. He was influential for, say, Cindy Sherman's photography, dressing up as some um, fictional characters or, or uh, emulating old paintings. He started the dressing up trend. Uh, he didn't make that many works, um, but the works that he made uh, were very uh, interesting. Now, Fountain is a really controversial piece because it raises the question, is it art? According to Duchamp, uh, a female friend sent him, um, one of his Dadaist female friends, sent him a plumbing fixture as a sculpture. And it is a found object. It's a ready-made. Uh, Duchamp put it into a show. Uh, he was um, on the board of Society of Independence Artists in New York, and they put up a show uh, which was not supposed to be a jury show, um, but it was a show where anybody could bring any art and it would be shown. And it was a um, it was a rebel act um, geared towards jury shows where so-called academic artists or artists that were part of the established art world or um, were well-known and opinionated, they would then jury the pieces that got in and the Dadaist type of arts, obviously, would not have gotten in. But yeah, he, he puts it in the show, it got rejected, even though Everybody said that it shouldn't be rejected because anybody could bring anything. Uh, what does he do to it? Well, he puts it on the side and he puts a signature into it, a pseudonym, Armat, and he dates it. So the question is, is it art? And of course, now several doctoral dissertations and books have been uh, written about this because it's a philosophical question. Art is what an artist does, says Andy Warhol. So if an artist decides to find an object or somebody sends him an object and he decides that yeah this is art and puts it into a show puts his name on it then he's chosen the piece and therefore when now art the art world um, accepts it as art then it becomes art and it stays art um, there are 70 replicas from this from the 1960s uh, and they were all sanctioned by uh, and approved by Duchamp himself um, when the when the piece was rejected from the show, uh, Duchamp resigned from the uh, board of the Society of Independent Artists. So he didn't want to be associated with them anymore because he thought they were insincere. Um, but he went on to make other ready-mades uh, uh, that we will talk about closely or more in detail about uh, in uh, another presentation uh, about uh, uh, Duchamp's uh, work. This is a cheap uh, postcard that Duchamp um, had of Mona Lisa. And Mona Lisa, of course, is now a very iconic painting. We have seen it uh, on t-shirts and coffee uh, mugs and mouse pads uh, so that we don't even look at the painting uh, because it's so etched into popular culture and uh, into our brain. Um, anybody who's ever uh, heard anything about art probably knows what Mona Lisa is. Uh, so he takes this iconic painting and he makes fun of it. Uh, so he pretty much thrashes uh, the canon of these great uh, uh, artists that have been so admired. So his question is, why is it so great? And are they really so great? And of course, he has a s sense of humor. His sense of humor is uh, he's a very affable man uh, that had a great sense of humor. Uh, so it's also a joke. And then uh, the, uh, what does he do to it? He doesn't do much to it. So not much skill goes into this uh, or effort goes into this uh, work of his. Uh, he puts a moustache and a beard on her, and then he puts these letters there that are short for for El Eshu Akul. She is hot for it. So she has a hot ass and she wants to get laid. 
Um, now, that's kind of a little bit like we see later in postmodernism, uh, in um, that um, postmodernist philosophers, especially, uh, went against the Western tradition and they questioned the Western tradition and the great narratives and these all these iconic. Um, works and uh, the authors of those works uh, that often were uh, dead white uh, males. So in that way, Duchamp was a pioneer in, uh, uh, in questioning uh, history and narrative. Hannah Hoch was one of the main, um, main figures in uh, Dada. Uh, she was part of uh, Berlin Dada. And this is uh, cut with the Dada kitchen knife through the last Weimar Beer Belly Cultural Epoch in Germany uh, is a collage that criticizes uh, uh, the Weimar uh, Republic. And um, um, Hannah Ho is seen as the originator of photomontage, which is when you cut up photographs and, and you uh, piece together an artwork uh, out of them. And he, she uses a col collage technique a lot as well, like in this one. Uh, there are different um, letters and uh, phrases and pictures cut from uh, contemporary uh, magazines and, and pasted onto a two-dimensional surface, and that makes the uh, collage. Collage is cut and paste. Um, important uh, American artists, Alfred Stieglitz, uh, the flat I am building, photograph from 1903. Uh, Alfred Stieglitz had an amazing career. He had altogether 55 years of photography, and he was married to the well-known artist Georgia O'Keeffe. And apart from being uh, a brilliant photographer, he uh, mentored uh, avant-garde artists and um, uh, made it possible for them to, to come to the US and have uh, shows uh, in New York. Dozia O'Keefe, his wife, um, did lots of paintings uh, of New York skyscrapers, so they have the same subject here. It's done in different uh, uh, ways, but um, uh, modernist photo and modernist painting. Uh, Georgia O'Keefe um, did um, flowers, size, skyscrapers, New Mexico landscapes, and, and she is often referred as the mother of North American modernism. Um, she's very well known um, of her flower paintings. And the flower paintings um, look like um, vaginas or female um, genitalia. But he was she was always um, saying that this was not the case and, and she wanted to go away from uh, uh, this kind of Freudian uh, or she wanted people not to interpret her paintings uh, in a Freudian fashion in that they are about uh, female sex organs, but, but they really look like that because they're close up flowers with these petals and, and then the middle that looks like going into uh, the female womb. Um, so in 1920, uh, or thereabouts, she moved into more representational uh, uh, way of painting and where her earlier work was more abstract. And she also uh, painted New Mexico landscapes and school skulls and uh, flowers there. I'm a painter mostly, so I tend to give short shrift to architecture, but we should not forget modernist architecture and uh, uh, postmodern architecture and architecture such as Frank Gehry's Guggenheim Bilbao uh, and what he's done in Seattle and Los Angeles. So all that uh, is part of uh, uh, 20th, important part of in uh, 20th century art. Uh, modernist architecture it's very simple, usually, and uh, it um, uses rectangles, basic forms. What, what's the most basic form? Cubists use cube. Well, their paintings didn't actually have rectangles so like Kashimar Malevich. They had this faceted, uh, geometric, analytical, um, uh, edgy uh, shapes in them. Uh, but cube and rectangle would be perhaps the simplest. You could argue that it's a circle is simpler or a triangle is simpler. But I would think that cube wins as being the most simple and basic uh, element of uh, artistic design. 
Um, this is Adolf Loos's Steiner House, house in Vienna, uh, Austria. It's an early example of uh, uh, modernist uh, architecture. Le Corbusier was a Swiss French architect. Um, he was a designer, he was a painter, he was a writer, and he was also a very prolific urban planner. Uh, he was concerned about people's living circumstances in crowded cities. And so he came, came up with, for example, a plan for a contemporary city that had three million inhabitants that he did in 1922. And he also worked in India, uh, helping to organize um, a city to be more friendly. Um, so he, he cared about people. This art was not snotty uh, art for art's sake, but he was very concerned about uh, the space that we occupy and, and where our everyday life uh, takes place and how architecture is um, such a vital uh, part of it. Villa Savoy uses uh, pilotis, which are these reinforced concrete stilts, so those little columns, or not so little, the columns that uh, you see uh, at the lower tier of the, uh, of the um, house. And those pilotes made it possible for the architect to design a free facade, an open floor plan, and then large windows um, that show the you know show a beautiful view from the inside. You get a beautiful view of the gardens and and the nature around uh, the building. And then uh, at the top there is a rooftop garden. So we're, all those elements uh, are in this. Uh, uh, house, and um, he was um, he was um, very uh, influential in these uh, designs. In that they immediately were um, popular in uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, countries, uh, especially in in Europe. Um, there is an architect uh, called Alvar Aalto in Finland, where I was born. That uh, then in the thirties uh, designed. Uh, a lot of buildings that uh, are influenced by um, designs of uh, Le Corbusier and other uh, European modernists. In Marseille, Le Corbusier made an utopian apartment block. A utopian means uh, utopia is a place, like an imaginary place where everything is okay. The sun always shines, there's always water, there's beautiful greenery, everybody's happy, uh, everybody has enough food, everybody has enough money. Um, and uh, he um, wanted everybody to be able to live in a nice place, in an apartment that has a lot of light and it's not too big, not too small. How much do you need? Uh, you don't need to have uh, a mansion, but you need to be comfortable. And, and that's, um, um, that's the kind of basic uh, tenant. Um, in his designing uh, these apartment blocks, that they need to be comfortable, they need to give uh, uh, people that live in them uh, a happy environment uh, uh, to go on with their life. Um, the chapel, Notre Dame du Haut, in Ronchamp, France, is um, uh, his later work, and it is, um, it's massive, it's biomorphic, um, it is not so strictly geometric as some of his other uh, designs. It's not so heavily relying on uh, straight lines and straight planes and uh, uh, rectangles and squares, uh, but it's more uh, romantic, perhaps, or uh, more, um, you know, looking like something um, softer and out of nature. It's um, made out of concrete and stone, and the stone, some of the stone comes from, came from a chapel that was destroyed in World War II, and that was in the same place. The floor follows the natural slope of the hill towards the altar. Uh, there are clerestory windows that bring in this magical light, uh, and um, there is uh, also white stone from Bourgogne that is used for the, uh, for the altar. So it's, um, a very beautiful place with stained glass and uh, beautifully placed uh, windows. And it's supposed to give you this spiritual experience like the Gothic cathedral did with the stained glass and going out uh, up in the sky, uh, towards the sky, going up in height. And that would then to lift your soul and, and make you feel that spiritual conne connection with a higher power, in, in this case, God. 
Frank Lloyd Wright, perhaps the most famous American art architect, falling water, um, kind of eccentric man, um, but more about that later. Falling Water uh, was um, a house that um, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright designed for Edgar Kaufman, who owned uh, Kaufman Department Store. And uh, this house is in rural Pennsylvania. Um, they discussed the house. Kaufman was upset about uh, uh, Wright wanting to put the house on top of the falls instead of below the falls, but Wright wanted to kind of give the experience of the Cascades and he wanted to anchor the house into nature. He was also influenced by Japanese architecture and perhaps that is somewhat evident uh, in this design. It's, um, uh, it's often um, uh, written about as the maybe best house in North America or at least the 29th best house uh, ever uh, designed in North America. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was rather short so it's it's not like low, uh, I mean it's not high in the ceiling. Um, many spaces where I've been, uh, I lived in Buffalo and there were lots of houses by him, um, they, they were kind of low but that's perhaps because of his height and because he also liked these elements that were kind of like stacked uh, and uh, uh, he uh, um, you know, tiered this uh, uh, these rectangular elements um, to look like the waterfalls. They mimic the waterfalls. And the stone, of course, the masonry, uh, is to be in tune with the rock of the landscape. Um, it's said about this house that um, Kaufman was kind of battering right to uh, uh, do the design and do the drawings and Wright lied to him and said, well, yeah, it's ready, but he hadn't done anything. So Kaufman said, well, okay, I'll be there in two hours, so um, we'll look at the drawings. And um, Wright's uh, assistants were horrified. They uh, they were like, oh no, now, now you know, uh, we don't have anything. But Wright sat down at his drawing table and calmly drew those um, uh, those um, plans uh, in two hours, which was the time that uh, it took Kaufman to get there. But they had lots of arguments about different things, and there were engineering problems uh, with this um, uh, with this um, house, and it's been repaired uh, since uh, and restored since. Uh, also, the masonry work had to be redone again while Wright was still alive because he wasn't happy with it. Um, and um, they were fighting with the construction company. And at some point, uh, Wright said that, well, to Kaufman that, uh, you know, just give me the, my designs back if you're not going to do what I want you to do. But finally, um, it was there. And um, it's a very, very impressive building. It's what's called a cantilevered structure. And that allowed more rooms. Uh, and it's made out of reinforced concrete. And then it has to uh, masonry uh, work. Um, the Kaufmans wanted to have separate bedrooms and they wanted to have a guest room and they also wanted to have uh, a room for uh, a visitor. So the cantilever uh, structure allows for all these uh, spaces uh, for them and uh, their guests. Vera Mukina, uh, a Russian sculptor, sculptress. Um, this is working and collective farm woman, sculpture from the Soviet Pavilion, Paris Universal Exhibition. And um, Russian constructivism, this is actually not really Russian constructivism, but Russian constructivism uh, was a movement um, during this time until now this social realism, and we have a taste of that, uh, the taste of that took over. Uh, because here are workers that are celebrated. Uh, they are the new power um, and they are the ones that are going to rule in the Soviet uh, Union. Well, we know that that didn't go well uh, in the end because communism is not a system that really uh, appeals to um, human nature or is in, is in tune with human nature because we want to uh, be rewarded for what we do according to what we deserve and not share everything with everybody, perhaps so, and it kills initiative. And there were other problems too, like oppression and uh, um, 
yeah, uh, it just wasn't a good system. Nobody wanted to do anything because, you know, if you um, if you break a tractor and it's not your tractor, it's, it's not your problem to uh, fix it. Anyway, so social realism becomes the style in Soviet Union. But before that, uh, there were um, supremacistic artists like Elisitsky that made these um, spaces like the prune room. Prune doesn't have an extra definition. This is in the tradition of Malevich, using geometric shapes. And here, the room is, um, this is a reconstruction, but it's the station where one changes from painting to architecture. So they were quite ambitious in modernist way, but when they were hounded out by uh, Stalin and the rise of um, social realism in Soviet Union, uh, they uh, left. But the influence was pretty strong uh, across uh, Europe and elsewhere. Uh, this is Piet Mondrian's composition with yellow, red, and blue from 1927. Mondrian actually, this is just a footnote, but he actually painted flowers. That's uh, maybe a little known fact that these didn't always sell so well. So he has some gorgeous uh, paintings of Amar amaryllis lilies, watercolors that are really breathtaking, but he uh, was a contributor to the style, the style, which is a Dutch art movement um, that started around seven, 1917. Um, artists and architects came together in the steel. And he, um, uh, Montrian, uh, developed this uh, non-representational art form called neoplasticism. And of course, the goal was pure abstraction. Uh, he later in life lived in Paris, and that's where he had the freedom to uh, really intellectually uh, perfect his uh, theories and his uh, paintings. Um, he was interested in theosophy, uh, which um, uh, was um, um, kind of new age uh, religion that was uh, popular, mixed of religions that were uh, popular at the time and during the you know, turn of the century, around 1900. Um, so um, he had philosophical aspirations uh, as well and, and wrote about uh, art. But composition, well, that refers to music again. Yellow, red and blue are primary colors and then square and rectangles, the most basic shapes uh, of uh, uh, art or design. Um, can you go any simpler? You probably can't. Schroeder House, an example of uh, rationalism in architecture. Um, this is still a modernist building, but um, the label um, or sub-label is rationalism. Gerrit Rietveld was a Dutch architect that built this house for Mrs. Schroeder and uh, her three children. And they worked closely together to achieve uh, uh, a space, a building that uh, was exactly as Mrs. Schroeder wanted it. Um, lots of uh, open space, lots of light coming in, different planes of uh, rectangular shapes and forms, uh, some pops of primary colors, but otherwise a very toned down palette of uh, white, uh, gray, and uh, uh, some black. Interior of Schroeder House with um, the huge windows. Um, maybe the you know furniture could be a little bit more comfortable, but the chair is iconic. You can buy it uh, on the internet, you can buy the a uh, real thing, or you can buy a little mini thing, uh, a reproduction of this chair. Um, but uh, looks like a really cool place with uh, with hardwood floors, uh, open floor plan, plan and uh, and uh, huge windows with lots of light. Bauhaus. Um, just shortly about Bauhaus. Uh, Bauhaus uh, was um, a German. Uh, school of design and it uh, functioned until uh, 1933 when the Nazis finally closed it. Nazis were against 
contemporary art and modern design, modernism. And they were also against um, expressionism. And Hitler used terms like Ent Artete Kunst, which means degenerate art. So all this was somehow not in the vein. They liked old art and they wanted to have art that like in the Soviet realism, is something that you can recognize. People look like people, landscapes look like landscapes. Hopefully something heroic that um, that um, shows off the Aryan race and uh, the policies uh, or the ideology of uh, uh, Hitler and the uh, German Reich. Um, Bauhaus means construction house. And it was a school where uh, all arts, design, architecture, uh, typography, graphic design, industrial design, um, painting, uh, furniture, uh, you know, all of that would come together and be uh, equal. It functioned in Weimar, in Dessau and Berlin from 1919 uh, till uh, that fateful year, 1933. And here's an example of some of the design uh, Marianne Brandt's um, coffee and tea service uh, uh, made uh, at Bauhaus. Um, some British uh, sculpture, Andrew Moore's uh, recumbent figure, uh, modernist uh, uh, sculpture. Um, this is obviously a female figure and it was um, made out of uh, uh, made from um, native stone for the house where it was uh, located. So it's a site-specific uh, sculpture originally made for a certain location from um, nearby materials. Surrealism. Here is a film still uh, from a film by Louis Bunuel, on Chien Andalou, Andalusian dog. Um, he's going to have his uh, I cut uh, with the razor blade. So it's a very disturbing li uh, film. And Bunuel's films are really, uh, they are really surreal and bizarre. There's one called The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, where uh, there's suddenly a flock of sheep in the living room when uh, the bourgeoisie, when the uh, middle class hostess is entertaining. And here, well, they didn't have very good special effects, so they probably used an egg for the slicing, uh, but it, it looks really creepy in the uh, in the movie. Salvador Dali is perhaps the best known surrealist artist, and he cultivated a very eccentric persona. He had ant eaters as pets. His, the pictures of him uh, walking his ant eaters in Paris, and uh, here, you know, the cats are flying across the uh, room, and he had this moustache, and... Uh, um, just generally I wanted to be different and he at some point um, he, here's a little um, print by Dali at some point he was so arrogant because he was very successful that he signed empty papers like papers where there was nothing and then he just put his signatures there because he thought his signatures it was a you know joke and a gesture uh, that his signature was already worth so much that he didn't even need to do the art. Well, what happened was, of course, some people got hands on them and started making fakes on them. So there are a few n number uh, of fake Dalis. So if you're going to buy one, make sure that it's uh, original and not, not one of these uh, that were signed by him, but then somebody faked something on it. Birth of Liquid Desires. And Salvador Dali is technically brilliant. Uh, his paintings are very detailed. Um, this, um, he, he joined the Surrealist group in 1929. And at the same time, he, uh, um, he started um, a relationship with Gala Eluard, that was his mistress and wife. And um, uh, Gala was very beautiful. Uh, she had lots of lovers. And allegedly, Dali um, has this condition called caudalism, where you want to watch your uh, wife have sex with other man, men. So it, there was this voyeuristic element to there. Um, it, it was kind of a troubled relationship, but they were really devoted to each other. And Dali used Gala as a model uh, all the time. Well, from that time is this painting, um, Birth of Liquid Desires a couple of years later. And um, it's been analyzed in the following fashion, that it, um, 
uh, has the story of William Tell in it. Uh, Dolly had a troubled relationship as a kid with his father, and William Tell um, is a story about a Swiss boy that uh, stands next to a tree and he has an apple on his head, and his father um, he has a bow and an arrow, and he shoots that ap apple off his head and, and hits the tree through that apple. So it's kind of parental assault. So here at the figures, there's um, father and son, and, and maybe there's mother as well. Uh, then there are lots of references, such as uh, there's the palette, artist palette, and then there are um, shapes that are maybe Catalonian uh, landscape shapes. Um, and there is um, the apple is beef, and that could be something to do with castration. So this kind of very kind of troubled relationship with being a man and, and being a son. And uh, the forms are biomorphic in that they remind you something kind of like in, in that happens in uh, forms uh, in nature. The Persistence of Memory by Salvador Dali. Um, this is perhaps about sleep because there is this uh, uh, form or shape or um, character uh, that has eyelashes in the middle of it and it's sort of Dali's self-portrait but he's asleep so he's dreaming and surrealists were very uh, fascinated by dreams what happens when you dream uh, and what's the um, uh, what's the difference between re dream and uh, reality? Uh, why do we have all these strange dreams? Uh, why do we, our brains work that way? And this is also about space and time because there's a watch and th this was a time when um, Dali painted lots of objects that usually are hard. They, he painted them to be kind of liquid and soft. Um, and there are ants and the ants stand for decay he uses them in lots of his paintings for like decay and, and being eaten by uh, ants. Max Ernst, uh, he was a surrealist that um, um, was German, but he lived in France for a while. And then he was arrested in France during uh, World War II, but he was released. Then he was arrested uh, by Gestapo. And he fled to U.S. with the help of Becky Guggenheim that uh, helped lots of uh, expat art uh, artists. And he, she had a gallery. She showed them in uh, New York. And he was married to Becky Guggenheim for a little while, but then married uh, Dorothea Tanning. Fireside Angel. It, some scholars have read references to the war, to this painting, the horrors of the war, uh, the Second World War. Uh, some suggest that it is fireside, you know, that home is the heart. That's where you cook your food and where, where everybody hangs out. And that should be a safe place, but it isn't because this is like a monstrous, uh, monstrous angel. Uh, but there is also um, something about um, Max Ernst's childhood that, that could um, have influenced his painting uh, because he painted lots of monstrous birds. He called them loplops, and they figure in many of his uh, paintings. And the birds uh, are derived from uh, when he was a, a child and he was in forest in Germany, and he was afraid of uh, all the possible monsters and the animals and the demons and the darkness of the um, pine trees and uh, you know the roots and whatever could be in um, the German forest that could uh, excite the imagination of a sensitive child. Uh, some um, Great Depression photography, Dorothea Lange's Migrant Mother, just as a side note here, uh, really, really emotionally powerful picture that has become iconic uh, about a mother uh, that probably doesn't know what's going to be for dinner and the two children then that she has to uh, protect and take care of. Uh, American Gothic by Grant Wood is, is a painting that has been uh, parodized and appropriated many, many times. People have um, done a different spin on it. Um, 
it's kind of funny painting. He was inspired by the house, the Gothic looking house. There's a window that looks like a window from a Gothic uh, cathedral. And he said that um, he wanted to paint the kind of people that would live in that kind of house. Uh, the models are the artist's sister and um, the family dentist. She's wearing this colonial print apron, uh, uh, which is like 19th century Americana type of garment. Uh, he's holding a pitchfork and they look very serious. So um, they are people that work hard. Uh, there is this hard labor and domesticity, you know, having this home, being together, being a couple, working for a living. And then she's obviously very prim and proper with the cameo, um, the cameo um, at her uh, collar and uh, the um, beautifully scalloped apron. Frida Kahlo, a Mexican uh, artist that was uh, married unhappily to uh, the uh, Mexican mural artist uh, Diego Rivera, Rivera, the two Fridas. Uh, this probably was influenced by a couple of paintings that Frida Kahlo saw in the Louvre of two sisters. But here she makes uh, the sisters into uh, a self-portrait. And uh, it's a first. It's the first large-scale work by her. By her, um, she is shown as Frida in Tejuana dress uh, on the left, and then uh, Frida in uh, sort of European style dress on the right. Her father was German, and her mother was Spanish Amerindian. But then there are the hearts. The hearts refer to, they're autobiographical uh, as well. They refer to all these surgeries and medical problems, uh, and the blood that she had to shed. Uh, she had a streetcar accident. She was in a terrible wreck in a streetcar when she was young, and that resulted in lifelong suffering and um, lots of problems. I mean, she had to spend a lot of time in a kind of uh, corset in a cast almost um, and couldn't move very well. Uh, so all the all the suffering and the you know fragility of the human body, um, and you have these you know uh, things that go, go wrong, and also the heart could be beating for Diego uh, because that relationship had its ups and downs, and um, she desperately wanted to have children, but she couldn't because of the injuries that she had in the streetcar accident, and Diego was unfaithful, so you know, she might be pining for him. Um, Francis Bacon, uh, head surrounded by sides of beef. Uh, this is Pope in the electric chair. Why would Francis Bacon uh, paint the Pope in the electric uh, chair? Well, Francis ba Bacon's um, uh, paintings are kind of uh, crude anyway, but um, he, he probably is criticizing the Catholic Church because of the church not approving of his lifestyle. He was openly gay and there are interviews where he says, you know, he comes right out with it. He's like, I like men and he likes them rough. He, he liked street types, you know, uh, street almost like prostitutes, uh, uh, kind of gangster type uh, guys, rough, rough uh, types. Uh, some that hang out in uh, uh, bars and get into bar fights and uh, uh, make a living by uh, some not very respectful uh, means or uh, in a respectful way. And of course, the Catholic Church wouldn't have anything to do with that, especially at the time, because this was 1954. So uh, mortality. Now, the Pope is not immortal. He's sitting in this electric chair, so he's being executed. And then he has slaps of Bacon, this carcass hanging on both sides. Uh, Bacon may have been influenced by uh, paintings by Shaim Soutine that painted a lot of flesh and uh, um, uh, meat. Uh, but he also said that he was um, always um, he was always fascinated by meat, especially when he was a kid and he went into butcher's shops and he saw different uh, kinds of. Uh, uh, slices of meat, so it looked very painterly. But this mortality, you know, we all end up as, as corpses uh, eventually. And the painting is um, uh, influenced by um, Velasquez's uh, Baroque painting, um, 
that um, shows Pope Innocent. And Pope Innocent doesn't look innocent at all. In fact, there is another painting by Velázquez, Pope Innocent and his son. And if you are the Pope, you're supposed to be celibate, you're not supposed to have a son. Uh, and in the Velázquez's painting, the Pope's face is really kind of like, um, he, he looks devious. Uh, Turks and Pollock, action painting. Now, uh, abstract expressionism uh, was a tremendously important uh, movement in the uh, uh, US. And Jackson Pollock perhaps was the um, most energetic representative uh, of abstract expressionism. And he developed this style action painting. His early work is a little bit um, murky and, and they are sort of landscapey. They are little, uh, they strive to abstraction, but they, they have lots of browns and, and some black in them. Uh, it wasn't that interesting, but then uh, he, um, he was introduced to liquid paint in 1936 at an experimental workshop in New York City by a Mexican muralist. And he possibly was influenced by an artist called Jane Sobel as well. He said that those paintings made an impression on him. So there could be different um, influences, but he started to drip paint and make this layered, um, layered uh, uh, compositions of uh, just swirls of paint. And they look very dynamic in real life, and they have st structure and some depth to it too. Uh, in reproduction, maybe they don't look as good as, uh, uh, they're very, very impressive uh, if you stand in front of one, and they're large scale, as you can see from what he's doing there. So he started dripping uh, resin-based algal paint. He was married to Lee Krasner that kind of nursed him because he was an, sort of nursed emotionally and, and maybe physically too, took care of him because he was a raging alcoholic most of his life and he died at 44 in a, a drunk driving accident he crashed. Uh, he may have been bipolar, some scholars say, but um, uh, he was certainly uh, a genius of kind and very influential artist. Here is autumn rhythm. These are, these are really, uh, they have movement, they're dynamic, they have uh, structure to them, and they have all these layers of, uh, uh, it's almost like calligraphy, um, beautiful painting. Lee Krasner was a little bit in the shadow of uh, um, Jackson Pollock because he was the really famous one, but she was a very accomplished artist herself. This is the seasons. This is still abstract expressionism. Uh, you can see some uh, fruit, perhaps, and some biomorphic uh, and na natural um, type of forms, um, some greenery and, and uh, certainly some kind of fruit. William de Gorning was an interesting artist. Uh, he was Dutch. He crossed the ocean to come to US as a stowaway on a freighter. So he came by boat as a stowaway and um, settled in, New, uh, in, in Virginia to start with, where he made a living painting houses. Um, then he moved to New York City and started uh, uh, doing fine art paintings uh, during his uh, free time when he was not uh, working. And he was very influenced by an artist uh, called Arshile Gorky, that, that lots of artists of this abstract expressionist were, were influenced by. He started this women series in 1950 when he met his uh, future wife, Elaine de Koning. And um, um, some abstract expressionists of the time didn't like this, or some critics didn't like these women because this is not abstract. You still see the women. Uh, so he kind of broke that rule of being like Jackson Pollock's strip paintings are completely abstract, uh, but these are not. Uh, so that was frowned upon by some. And when, I, when you look at the women, um, they are kind of disturbed. Look at the head and the eyes and the breasts. So she is kind of nutty and, and somewhat vicious too. Look at the mouth. Uh, but she's powerful, she's big, she has huge boobs. Uh, so she, um, she, you know, embodies desire, frustration, conflict, and maybe pleasure uh, at the same, same time. So kind of very conflicted view. Uh, of women. And of course now the uh, painterly style 
is uh, extraordinary. Uh, it's it's lush. It's powerful. It's aggressive. Um, his later paintings have been criticized a lot uh, because he had Alzheimer's. He was also um, drinking a lot. Um, he said once that uh, he started to do that because of anxiety and somebody said, oh, well, have a little drink. And then he did and he had another one and then it started. But but he got Alzheimer's and he was still painting. And now, of course, dealers want these to be masterpieces so that they can sell them. But um, the you know, jury is still out whether they are his best work or whether they are just something that he still get painting, but they're not as powerful as this uh, earlier work of his. Helen Frankenthaler, uh, abstract expressionist painter, very successful uh, New York um, art star of her time uh, that made these uh, gorgeous canvases where she would often use raw canvas and then pour um, diluted washes on it uh, to make these paintings that are soft and, and gorgeous and they are large scale paintings. Um, she is often um, described as somebody that was uh, one of the forerunners of color field painting. Color field painting itself is a little bit later style, but she's certainly one of the artists that could be like early color field and um, uh, had an influence on what was to come after that. There's an anecdote about her that she was so wealthy that she was, uh, she made a deposit uh, on a house in New York and then changed her mind and, and the deposit was $400,000. Well, it's very, very rare for any artist to make that much money, but uh, apparently there has been some in the history of American art. Colorfield painting, Mark Rothko is still an, technically an abstract expressionist, but he was very influential for colorfield painting. So again, he could be also um, be kind of in the borderline area of going from abstract expression to a, a subtitle color field and then color field uh, painting that is uh, a, a style that comes uh, right after this. Um, he was a Jew that was born in Russia and then he moved to New York like so many others. Um, he started out making representational work. Um, they often have mythological or landscape uh, subjects, but then he moved on to make um, paintings that had rectangular fields of uh, color. Um, the paintings were called multiform, and uh, he became incredibly successful that, and they had some spiritual dimension at times. There's, for example, there's a Mark Rothko uh, ch uh, chapel and that has his paintings. And, and they have these fields of color and you're supposed to meditate and, and gain some kind of spiritual uh, connection by looking at these paintings. Um, he was rather successful for a while, but then he was incredibly depressed and uh, um, unfortunately ended up slashing his wrists. His assistant found him and uh, he had cut his wrists and bled to death. So there is maybe a dark side too. And we'll talk about that later because he uh, held different kind of lectures. And um, there is one where he talks about death, that painting ought to have some kind of connection to death. Abstract expressionist Barnett Newman, again, somebody that influenced color field painting. Vir heroicus sublimis, man heroic and sublime. What is this painting about? It was his largest canvas at the time when uh, he released it. And it is red with a couple of uh, stripes in it. Well, there's the scale. It's a heroic painting just in terms of its scale. What about being sublime? Well, the color is so vivid that if you are confronted with so much red, the red begins to kind of pull you in and sing to you. It begins to vibrate. So you probably have an emotional response to it. And of course, you can think about red lights, uh, passion, love, um, something, blood, uh, you know, you, lots of things that you can read into the color uh, red. But it is um, chromatic abstraction. And uh, uh, it may be influenced by Jung. Jung was a psychologist or psychiatrist like uh, Sigmund Freud. Um, 
his idea of the collective conscious. Uh, how does that work in case of painting? Well, you can take one color and you remove it from its context and um, it becomes different. It, it becomes part of kind of another world. And Newman talked about painting, or this type of painting, that it's kind of the same as meeting a person. And that sounds quite Jungian, that, that you meet the painting and you react to it. And it would be the same as meeting a person. You kind of, you know, start to think, well, what do I think? What kind of vibe do I get from this? And uh, hey, uh, hello, or mm, I don't know. Um, so that's some of the um, perhaps symbolism uh, behind this uh, painting. And um, next time we'll go further um, into um, contemporary art by looking at works of art such as pop art by Andy Warhol and uh, we'll go as far as the end of the um, 20th uh, century uh, video art, um, Tony Ausler. Um, we look at uh, um, lots of other things in between. So stay tuned and keep reading the book um, and I will be talking to you. <laughs>